Hi, everyone. Here is Fluffy with me, and Chocolate is playing in the room next door. And I have good news. We broke through 213,000 subscribers this week. And thank you in all languages to all of you tuning in from other countries. This week, there was excitement on Monday and Tuesday when NASA revealed more images from the James Webb Space Telescope. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson told President Joe Biden on July 11th at the White House that this first infrared deep field image of the galaxy cluster SMACS 0723 is the highest resolution image of the infrared universe that any human on Earth has ever seen. This galaxy cluster is 4.6 billion light years from Earth. Scientists hope Webb will eventually see all the way back to the beginning of this universe at 13.8 billion years ago. As beautiful and exciting as exploring this universe is, back on Earth on Monday, July 11th, there was this sobering nuclear preparedness public service announcement by the New York City Emergency Management Office posted on YouTube. And why are Homo sapiens so violent with each other and always warring? I asked my military aerospace source if he has had briefings about the true history of human evolution on Earth. He answered that what he has been told is that Homo sapiens sapiens are a genetic blend of three different extraterrestrial groups. They are the progenitors of Earth humans, if he is correct. He says that one of the ET groups manipulating human genetic evolution has been historically from the closest solar system to Earth, Alpha Centauri, only 4.2 light years from us. It has three stars, Centauri A, Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. The two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, orbit one another closely, while Proxima orbits around the pair. Last year, in 2021, there was discovery of a rocky planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. And then in March of 2022, Yale University astronomers concluded that if there is a rocky planet in the Alpha Centauri A and B double star system, it is likely to be similar to Earth's geochemistry and so might support life forms like our planet Earth does. My source says a second group of genetic manipulators of Earth life have come from the Procyon A and B binary star system that is 11.46 light years from Earth. Our government's main interest in this Procyon A and B solar system is the fact that blonde, blue-eyed, so-called Nordic humanoids, from there seem to have had historic interaction with humanoid primates on Earth, going back a very long way, at least 70,000 years or more, is one government intelligence estimate. Biologically, we seem to have much of our physical attributes from the blonde Nordic group associated with the Procyon A and B solar system. Those Nordics refer to us, Earth humans, as, quote, their offspring, close quote. My source says the evidence supports the supposition that we Earth humans perhaps even originated at Procyon A and B long ago. The implication is that maybe the blonde and blue-eyed Nordics experimented with humanoid life and then transported what they created to the watery, life-supporting planet Earth that is only 11.46 light years from Procyon, and they watched to see what would happen to their humanoid experiment. My source says that a third group of genetic manipulators of Earth life and humans have come from the Sirius binary system. Sirius is the brightest star in Earth's night sky, and the word Sirius in Greek means glowing or scorching. Sirius A is the brightest star in the Earth's sky. Sirius B is a very small, faint, 
white dwarf companion to Sirius A. You can see it, that little dot where the pointer is. They are 8.6 light years from Earth. Surprisingly, my military aerospace source says before Sirius B changed from a main sequence star to a white dwarf 134 million years ago, it had intelligent life forms colonizing planets and other solar systems, including Earth. This is information that we have allegedly learned from the blonde ETs that now inhabit the Sirius system. In fact, the Mali tribe in Africa could be a genetic upgrade by the Sirius B extraterrestrials as described in this famous 1976 book, The Sirius Mystery, was Earth visited by intelligent beings from a planet in the system of the star Sirius? The author, Robert Temple, was a Sanskrit scholar and fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He focused on the secret traditions of the Dogon tribe in Mali, Africa, 2,300 miles southwest of Egypt, reported about by French anthropologists in 1954. The Dogon tribe described a small, dense star near Sirius that is totally invisible and was only discovered by telescope before being photographed for the first time in 1970 at the U.S. Naval Observatory. And yet, the Mali Dogon tribe knew that near the bright, visible Sirius was a much smaller, very heavy, invisible star that took 50 years to orbit Sirius. Temple was stunned when he found out that mid-20th century astronomers had calculate, cal calculated that it did take Sirius B 50 years to orbit around Sirius A, matching what the Mali tribe had told them. Robert Temple showed that 5,000 years ago in the ancient Mediterranean cultures of Sumer and Egypt, these helicopter and aerial craft carvings were by ancient civilizations that possessed not only great wealth and learning, but also a knowledge dependent on physics and astrophysics, which the Sumerians and Egyptians claimed was imported to them by extraterrestrial visitors from Sirius A and B. My military aerospace source says the humanoid civilization that inhabits the Sirius A and B solar system are, quote, the oldest race we currently know of in the nearly 30 solar systems we have now cataloged in our galactic arm of the Milky Way with the help of the blonde Nordics and the tall whites. They possess extreme technology, but they do not share much of it with us humans, close quote. Both Sirius A and B are populated by the same race that my source says has had the most involvement with our development to current modern Homo sapiens sapien, while Procyon A and B might have had the oldest presence on Earth. Back in December of 2020, a year and a half ago, there was excitement in my source's military aerospace world about, quote, ruins, close quote, found on a planet in the Procyon A solar system only 11.46 light years from Earth. The next month in January of 2021, a research space vehicle such as the USS LeMay or Helen Ketter or Vandenberg was tasked to go to Procyon A to investigate. My source was told that the Procyon A ruins have ties to a structure found close to Gale Crater on Mars, where the Curiosity rover has been exploring since its landing there on August 6th of 2012. My source was told that the ancient discovery are rune symbols that, quote, are part of a network of old structures that crisscross several different star systems and lead back to our Earth's solar system Close quote. My source says, one colleague of mine was the very brilliant physicist and engineer John R. Tucker, who revolutionized space science. 
He was a principal communication engineer years ago, investigating the capabilities of the extraterrestrial technology known as the Yellow Book, because words projected in it glowed with yellow light. That ET technology is described as a very advanced version of what today we call iPads, and it can project hollow forms or holograms from the Yellow Book into three-dimensional space. He said, we discovered the ET Yellow Book had the true history of Earth and the multitude of human-like species that lived and developed on Earth in prehistory and on other Earth-like planets out to a distance of 754 light years from Earth. The ET Yellow Book is considered one of the highest security classifications in existence in both military and civilian research. John Tucker was also the lead engineer who helped us out with quantum tunneling protocol in deep space to produce instant long-range communication. This was accomplished by JPL's micro devices lab known as MDL. The Yellow Book was allegedly a gift given to us in an exchange program with gray ETs. It is said that the gray ETs home planet suffered destruction from something like a gamma ray burst or a violent coronal mass ejection or something with a lot of energy in it. The planetary destruction caused the extraterrestrial biological entities to reach out to a planet they were familiar with and to its human life forms for help here on Earth. Allegedly, a treaty for an exchange program was done that allow those beings to harvest from Earth animals and humans to regenerate their biology. This exchange allegedly is ongoing now and has been ongoing since a 1954 treaty signed by President Dwight Eisenhower after three different meetings he had with one or more ETs that I talked about last week on this Earth Files YouTube channel. Today, after 68 years, this ongoing treaty exchange has the highest classified information, even above POTUS, the President of the United States. I now want to share with you an extraordinary comment posted last week by an anonymous source under the Earth Files YouTube channel video release of my documentary, From Brains to Galaxies, The Key is Frequencies. Here is the anonymous message, quote, Decades ago in 1996, I had severe sleep ap apnea and wasn't using a CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Breathing Device. One night, I must have stopped breathing for too long, and this happened. I awoke to find myself standing in the presence of a huge sun or sphere of light, quickly understanding that this sun was pure conscious awareness. Although its surface was only swirling light and did not have a face, it seemed as if it was smiling at me and had nothing but love for me. I felt its thoughts as one with my own and felt it peering deeply into my own awareness, knowing everything about me all at once. Standing in its presence, I was overcome by a deep sense of awe, and at the same time I was surprised to find myself so fully conscious in this empty but light-filled void. There was nothing in existence for me but myself and this bright, bluish-white sun smiling its awareness at me. It was unlike any place on Earth, and yet as real as waking reality, in fact, it was more real. I was super-conscious. Suddenly, I came to a profound awareness that this sun was God. I was so overwhelmed and surprised that God was real that I mentally gasped and then yelled out, 
you are real. I had always had a deep mistrust of religion. Years before this experience, I had decided for many seemingly valid reasons that religion and God were only a product of the human mind. Yet there I was, standing in the presence of what I knew without a doubt. It was God. What I had previously thought to be the truth about the universe was shattered, and I stood there stunned, having had my world turned around so quickly. I was happy because I had always hoped that God was real and that there was a future beyond the physical. As I stood in its presence, I perceived myself to be nothing but pure awareness and without a body. This sun of awareness fully merged with me, seeing everything inside of me. It saw everything I had ever done and failed to do, both good and bad. And yet, I did not sense or feel this being was judging me or my past. There was no serial or motion picture-like review of my life, just a sudden and full knowing about all things I have ever done, thought, and experienced. Because this son of awareness, God, was peering so fully and deeply into me, I felt totally naked more naked than if I were standing without clothes in front of a million people. This being seemed to be the consciousness of everyone I had ever known, plus that of millions of others. It seemed to be everyone, but incredible as it might seem, most of all it seemed to be me. Even though I had no awareness of having a body, this feeling of nakedness was more than I could stand. Before I had time to think about what I was doing, I began moving away from this being as fast as I could. It wasn't that I was afraid, nor that I wanted to get away from this wonderful sun of light. It was more like an automatic response to feeling more naked than I thought naked could be. As I was traveling away from this being, I found myself bursting through some kind of barrier into a blackness that was filled with wonderful stars and space. As I continued moving forward at a tremendous speed through the star fields, I soon found myself slowing down as if I was up against another barrier or membrane. It seemed to stretch slightly and then I burst through it into another blackness of star-filled space. I continued to speed away faster and faster, but regardless of how much physical distance I traveled, I was never any farther away from the sun of awareness at all. I quickly traveled through several star-filled spaces, at least six of them beyond the great sphere of light, each separated from one another by barriers that I was easily penetrating. As I passed through each layer, my speed increased each time, but the sun's consciousness was still with me. It was still deeply within my own consciousness. And all of a sudden, I fell through the top of my bedroom ceiling, hit my body with a jolt, and immediately woke up. The jolt was so strong that my bed physically bounced as my body jerked away in response to the sudden stop. I opened my eyes and immediately spoke in a low and powerful voice. I am that great I am. I said this almost involuntarily. The words spilled out of my mouth without even thinking about what or why I was saying it. I also knew what this meant, that I was the very consciousness that I was trying to get away from. As much as I tried to get away from that sun of awareness, I could never get one fraction of an inch farther away from it, no matter how far or fast I traveled. Even after waking up, it was still with me. To this day, I still feel and know its presence. I believe that this sun intelligence God was not a single being, but is the center of all beings. It is me, 
you and perhaps all conscious beings. From this experience, I think that somewhere at the center of each of us is a spark of this same light. And without it, we would not have consciousness. And perhaps without us, it would not exist either. As I was flying away from this sun being, I had the impression that I was traveling through several layers within a sphere, but I was bursting through layers like the layers of an onion. But between each layer was star-filled space. I can't really tell you if I was traveling from the inside out or the outside in, but as I traveled through them, I had an impression that the further I got from the sphere of light, the smaller I got and the more divided I became. If I had the chance to do it over again and stand in the presence of this sun intelligence God, I wouldn't run away from it no matter how startling it is to be seen to such depth. I now hope that I would stand in its presence no matter how naked I felt I don't believe that my motive for running was because I couldn't stand to face the light or that I felt like a bad person, but because I was so unaccustomed to being seen so fully, so suddenly, so clearly, and to such depth. Unfortunately, my flight away from it took place before I could think of what I was doing and why. The words I spoke after the experience, I am that great, I am. It meant that although I am an individual here, I am also a part of every other consciousness at the great central point of consciousness. That is God. I am now secure in the knowledge that this presence of consciousness has always been with me and that I have never been alone and never will be alone. I now know that this presence is closer to me than anything else in the universe. I had been so accustomed to it that I didn't know it was there, much like becoming used to a smell in a room. Once you are there with it long enough, it begins to fade into the background like silence. It is always there, maybe in the background, behind and between the sounds, but always there, like a quiet, pure awareness, completely silent, but ever-present, to find it within. Listen to the silence, and then try to find what is behind it, it's there as strong as your own silent awareness, forever smiling at you. Thank you, Anonymous, for sending what I think are brilliant words that I wish the whole planet in all languages, all countries could absorb and change overnight in their perception of every one of the eight billion of us on this planet. And that our relationship, not only with other beings in this galaxy, beyond to other galaxies, beyond to the infinity of the cosmos, that is wondrous, wondrous in its consciousness that seems to go on forever and that we have life and living consciousness here within it and ongoing as it travels to infinity. I just felt that these words in these pages from this anonymous voice I wanted to share with you tonight. At the same time, in the same few days, that the city of New York put out a public awareness, public service, about what to do in the case of a nuclear attack. In the name of rationale, 
sanity. May humans not go in that direction. May you and all humans everywhere go in the direction of these profound words. With that, Ian, I transfer over to you for comments, questions, and I just want to say I love all of you. I feel it strong pressure in my chest, the agape love for consciousness of fellow beings. That's what I feel. Ian. Linda, thank you for that. That was pretty powerful. We've had some comments already on that statement uh, that you just read out. Transgressive chemist says, I've had a similar solar vision and I had sleep paralysis concurrently when I was 14. I was napping on the couch. I'm full of goosebumps. Oh, now and all, ask yeah. him, or we'll, let's ask him. For those of you who may have had experiences somewhere like Anonymous, let me know. I find this fascinating and encouraging. This is when I've said over the last four years that I think the strongest part of Homo sapiens sapien is our soul. It is that quantum connection that we have with the infinite cosmos, with the consciousness, whatever words and letters you want to call it. And that is what is so exciting to learn that people are having these experiences. So thank you, Ian, go on. Okay, transgressive chemist, please give us more details. I know you're still in the chat. Sarah Keller says, I always saw a bright source we were all connected to. We all exist because we exist. Yes, yes. Go, go, keep, keep giving us insights here. <laughs> this is great. Okay, yes, we'll, we'll keep them coming in. Sarah Keller also says, do the aliens also regenerate the human bodies they harvest genetics from? Do they upgrade DNA as well? It's an excellent question. It is a question that I've also pursued with people who have been in military or aerospace or medicine or some sort of science in terms of, um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn and put this up. This is my third book. They were out of order. Because this is really important for you all to understand because I don't think it is necessarily scary. Some people think it, some of this stuff is insidious, and maybe, maybe not. And let me see, Brad, can I get this in here? Can you see, maybe, can I, can you hold that? So we can, it's, yeah, it's the... It's the bodies in the tubes, and we're doing this live. We had not rehearsed anything like this. See, these are tall, tall, these are tall ETs here. There are humans. It's a big mix. And this description in, this is Glimpses Volume 2, uh, six people that I've featured with their illustrations all of them having encountered these tube technologies in which the particular non-humans in that case were praying mantises overseeing uh, some kind of greys um, and also tall blondes, uh, black haired, tall black haired humanoids. So it wasn't like one non-human seemed to be doing this. There was a, a variety across six people's experiences, and if you boil them all down into what could this possibly be, the beings explained it, that there was something very important about, they kept track of certain people apparently in, whether it's a, you want to call it a medical project or a social project, and that in their tracking, if you had rheumatic fever as a child, as one of them did, and the heart was damaged, and the beings explained to one woman that uh, her heart was going to fail, 
and it would be too young. And they said it is important that the soul stay with the body container for a certain length of time. I have mentioned this before. And they have these different discussions with these different people in these uh, half a dozen experiences. Now, uh, every, uh, as far as I know, every one of those people and one that's called Juana in this chapter, she is very much still alive, has had an experience in the last two years in which she seemed to go again into something that related to this idea of preservation and that passing other dimensions, whether it's uh, whatever the, the transition is, we usually think of death as a transition to another dimension, that somehow these interactions by some of the beings seem to be focused on, and I think it relates to the soul energy, that we go through body through body, container, container, and that they have a, an interaction with it that to all of the six people is not exactly clear. They don't fully understand, but they do feel that the beings cared about their survival. And so that takes from there, from the people who experience it, it wasn't like they were describing something that terrified them. They were describing something and making the drawings to explain that this had happened. And then when I have six with six different drawings, I think that that is worth reporting. Probably the relationship between bi biological consciousness in this universe versus other consciousnesses in, let's say, other dimensions. This may be the whole key to everything that goes on in this particular universe. And we are at what I think is a dangerous and crucial crossroads. Humans are like, it reminds me of being on a motorcycle and going too fast and thinking you can still make it around the next bend that is a sheer cliff that goes to the ground if you don't make the turn. It's as if there is so much fraction, fracturedness, that the energy on the planet is so fractured so many things are fighting each other, that that is the energy that would translate to the thought that dwells in the light, to, the, to whatever the letters or syllables you want to use for the consciousness of God. And that we get what we think. We get back the energy that we give out and that that is why this is a really dangerous time and that maybe there are non-humans maybe in procyon a and b or sirius a and b or uh, the uh, tall whites planet maybe they are really trying to help us because they have a vested interest in having manipulated dna at least three different ones and that there is a vested interest in what happens on this planet and what happens to human life. But until we are all told the whole same truth, we have all of these different energy pieces that are kind of like chaos around the planet. And it seems like this is the time if we were able to have cohesion around thought, around soul, around surviving in peace and love and exploration, 
and learning how to interact with other beings in the universe, finally with some truth. That alone might change the entire destiny of our planet. So, my, I, I would love to hear uh, any other stories like the one we had. And if any of you have had the experience of being with beings and taken into these rooms with these tubes that have some light at the top and the bottom, and that some people come away saying, wow, uh, I'm going to keep going on in that body. Other people have other reactions. We all need to know more and learn more. And that's one of the energies here in the Wednesday night that I'm trying to share with you and have you share back with me. Okay, Ian, what else have we got? Well, we've got um, the transgressive uh, chemist has got back to us with a little bit more detail. Uh, he says that um, he woke up and doing the sleep paralysis and he questioned what the light was. He was spiritual then and now it makes, set, it makes some higher order truth. He's got more information to share by the looks of it. Also, some breaking news. The author of that uh, section that you just read out from the comments that you just read out, he's actually in the chat this evening. He oh. says, thank you for reading my experience in 1996. He's in Doha, Qatar at the moment, and it happened to him while he was in Palmer, Alaska. Wow, thank you. So this is anonymous, and uh, this is great. Uh, if you're listening, or Ian, say to him or communicate to him, uh, I would very much appreciate, uh, even by email, uh, to connect for uh, further dialogue, if possible. Right. He can contact you directly at earthfiles, earthfiles. at earthfiles.com. That's right. Always think of a reporter who files news about the earth and more and more and more beyond. Um, so it's earthfiles at earthfiles.com. Joseph Anthony also says in the chat, I've had the same experience too. Of which one? <laughs> which experience? <laughs> yes. Well, you asked for it. People are responding. Okay. Also, we've got a, uh, some comments about people encountering ETs in their day-to-day -day life and uh, how ETs are walking amongst people. Purple Hayes says, uh, long story short, I was once at work. A car pulled up and stopped in front of our place. I was standing there wondering who or what they were doing when they waved at me. And I swear on everything, I, I saw their hand shape shift from a human hand to three long white fingers and then back into a human hand and then drove away. Well, that uh, holoform issue, um, the word as it's been described to me means that some of these beings are able to project. Remember uh, when uh, Buddy was doing the remote viewing on the trinoloids, which are a whole other kettle of fish, uh, are a threat and uh, he was doing the remote viewing and found that they can appear to us in anything in the environment or be totally invisible. And that it is like putting up the word that Buddy uses, like a holoform, they can project frequencies that the human mind then sees as something in the environment. So we've also got. Resonance Waves, who says, I had the experience with that same sun, but I was also with three little beings. Which type of little beings? Yeah, it's always important for people when type. they say that they've had encounters with other beings to please let us know which types yeah. that they're experiencing. Yeah, so uh, follow up and, and in the chat, uh, communicate what those little beings were like physically. Okay, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, okay, I've got to do the super chats now, okay. Linda. So here we go. We've got Moonbird. Hi, Moonbird. <laughs> yeah, Moonbird is actually in, uh, on a road trip, actually, and he's actually it's in Santa Clara, I believe, New Mexico. He's stargazing this evening. Well, that's good. He says uh, on this, there, there are more, these are more than dreams, these are entanglements. More than dreams, these are entanglements. And the idea of entanglement from there uh, in the quantum world 
entanglement means that you can have instant communication, like from where I'm sitting here to the end of this universe, 13, 8 billion. I could have, if, some, if we had entangled photons that were somehow placed, we could have instantaneous communication, which has always been confusing to people because you say, well, but the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. So how can you have something instantaneous? That is the wonder of that particular entanglement physics, that that is the way it works. And that's why the Chinese have been placing entangled photons on the moon. So they would have instant communication with whatever that they would have there uh, that might be a, a manned uh, mission. It would be instant. So entanglement, uh, is that Moonbird is his phrase? I would like to know how he is, uh, ex is defining that. Are you there, Ian? Yeah, he's in a conversation with transgressive chemist, who was the one who said that they'd had all, had the same visions when he uh, when he was fourteen, and said that they were full of goosebumps. And he's talking to transgressive chemist uh, in a conversation. But he's Moonbed also says the research area in dreams he specialises in is the other archetype as discerned in the myth personal experience. The other ultra-terrestrial messenger has always been there. It's our cultural lensing. Well, uh, the words for that used entanglement, can you repeat that sentence again and who said that? Moonbird, in response to transgressive chemist, he says, yes, these are more than dreams. These are entanglements. Stay tuned. Okay, and the, that's the question. I understand these are more than dreams. These are entanglements with... Can he fill in the blank tonight? <laughs> we'll look for that. The chat's moved so fast yeah. tonight. Moonbird. So Moon <laughs> fill it in. So we'll look out for it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to continue with the super chats this evening. We've got uh, Lane57, Joe Rinica, Traz, Christina Ledesma Jimenez, Sir Henrique, Jessica Rodriguez from Massachusetts, Philip Presswood, Green Nightingale, Dorothy Austin, Nunya, and she says, Linda, will you please give a birthday shout out to my husband, Charles, we're watching you now. Oh, Charles, happy birthday. Agape love for this planet, for this universe. Let's just concentrate that we agape love everybody. Happy birthday with agape love. Okay, and we've also got a message from Victor Prime, who's streaming from Nigeria in Africa. He says, uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And we've also got another message for you from, uh, from a viewer in Ecuador. And they say, Ecuador loves you too, Linda. Oh, I love you. I love all of you. Let's just continue to try to spread knowledge, facts, and agape love with as many people as we can and with our furry souls on this planet. That is another thing. It seems like every day I cry over a commercial, seeing something happening to animals. We've got to love and respect the other life on this earth, even if some people I understand would depend on some of that for their survival. But, uh, oh, if we just all loved everything more. Okay, Ian. Okay, Linda, here is another question from Rosanna Rigby. She says, my question is to Linda, all of her sources that she gets her information from, are they not afraid to be caught out or to get into trouble when they share their stories and proof to us? Oh, very. And that's uh, why I have to work very, very, very hard um, on protecting people. And I have uh, my whole professional life. And... Um, it, it, it is a big responsibility, and I can't talk about it in detail. Uh, I, I, live, um, I live a very difficult and challenging work life, but I wish I could share with you the handwritten letters 
and uh, proton males the, of people who have thanked me for being able to report some facet that they have shared with me and do it in such a way that no one will ever know who they really are. And um, that's, I work at that because I've been waiting for 43 years for the government of the United States and the world to tell the truth. The truth is this universe has had conscious life evolving in it for billions of years. And we, we deserve to have that information and to have that be denied to me is abuse, as I have said before. The government will give its arguments for why it feels that it must sustain these policies of denial in silence. I disagree. I grew up as an American. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Um, I traveled as a teenager uh, to speaking rallies and conferences. Um, in college, uh, I was working for a newspaper, um, had my back beaten with a billy club over protesting the Vietnam War. So it wasn't like I was immune from being aware of how things can move to uh, conflict, including physical conflict. But I think because of the way I was raised, my mom and dad uh, never tell a lie, uh, always do your, the best you can. Uh, the, the United States of America is a great country. It is an incredible experiment trying to have a government of, by, and for the people in which the people would be the directors of how the government evolved. And then we learn that perhaps because of wars, but also because of greed, that all governments on the earth seem to always evolve to an elect tiny minority that have all the power, have all the weapons, have all the money. And there's something in me that feels that trying to share the truth, that we're not alone in this universe, what a preposterous concept to have overlaid evolving humans. It's angering, actually. And that as we look out into the rest of this particular century, if we survive ourselves, which I don't think is yet decided, to think of the universe without Homo sapiens sapien, it would just seem to me a tragedy. The gifts from our hearts and our souls and our art and our music, the geniuses of some human minds. We would be like taking a whole swath from the Pontalisma painting off and leaving nothing. And it may be that if we knew the whole huge truth about this particular universe that we're in, this particular third dimensional universe, that Tom Campbell, the Army Intel physicist, uh, has come the closest. That the whole reason for this universe and everything in it is to teach how to be an entropy reduction trainer for souls. So to lose humans to nuclear war, it it's, would be from my point of view, that's an act of such insanity that it doesn't even seem comprehensible. And that's why we seem to be in some kind of a strange balance. But by God, I'm pulling for you. I'm pulling for humans. I'm pulling for those ETs that seem to give some care about us and a space force 
that I understand has already been, and now the number I've heard is in 28 solar systems cataloging, and there's 168 civilizations with structures and undergrounds and all sorts of things, 168 civilizations just in this one little arm of the, in between the two bigger arms of the Milky Way galaxy. And you look at the uh, James Webb incredible infrared photo of just, they were stressing that head of NASA said that what we see in that incredible, beautiful image that we use tonight of all of those galaxies going on and on and on and on, that it's only the size of a grain of sand of the universe. My God, it's such an exciting place if we could just get past uh, inequities and war and, and secrets about what is really in this universe that every human deserves. So, what else, Ian? Nenda, could you remind everyone to hit the likes and also to hit the red triangle in the bottom right of the screen and subscribe? You guys, I understand it doesn't cost anything for you, but it helps us at YouTube. Uh, it would be great if we could break through 214,000 in a few days. If you click on that uh, red rectangle or whatever it is in the lower right corner. Triangle. Uh, triangle. And uh, that would be to subscribe. And if you like the work that I am trying to share with you, uh, click the like button. Okay, Linda, we've got some more super chops to catch up with. There's Cindy B, Jeff Francis, Sarah Underwood. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Odin because he's given a very generous donation in super chats this evening. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much. Um, I just really appreciate uh, every step of the way because uh, it's, uh, this is a lot of hard work, but I love it. And it's great to know that you guys uh, support it. So thank you from the bottom of my soul and heart. Vargas, one of our regulars as well, says she understands exactly what Moonbird is saying about entanglement. She has her own experiences with a certain ET that shows up as a tall man, says I can feel him in his presence. Uh, Moonbird has also said to follow up. These are entanglements with a unified field of consciousness, which both includes everything we know and everything we can't imagine. Now, uh, yes, that is a great definition, too. Yeah, yeah, Moonbird, I, I grok that. Thank you. Okay, Lido, we've also got people, uh, someone who's got an experience, and I've heard this experience from others, I said, Linda, about 50 years ago when I was a kid, I had dreams that we came from Mars after something terrible happened. I did not see it in TV or a radio show because I grew up in East Germany. Uh, that's from Blue Sky. I have heard um, probably a dozen variations on what you just quoted from. Of people who will have a dream, they describe the color of the planet, that as far as they're concerned, it is Mars. Childhood dreams where they, there's some kind of war. Uh, they're underground or they're in some kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, just a structure. And it's fascinating because John Brandenburg, who wrote Death on Mars, uh, he is a, a Ph.D. nuclear physicist, and his book is based on his analysis uh, from Viking data about various um, what would be uh, at, a, at atomic levels related to something that would be a residue after a hydrogen bomb or an atomic bomb. And the book is about what he found and his hypothesis that Mars has the ingredients that could be left by two hydrogen bombs exploded over the Northern Hemisphere and specifically over the Cydonia region where the face on Mars and the fort and the 
uh, various uh, parts there that were first reported in, the, I think, 1980, 81, 82, uh, by people who were studying Mars photographs and uh, concluded that this was some kind of civilization and structure. And the people that I have read uh, letters from, they seem to uh, be uncertain themselves. Is it a dream within a dream and they can't really... Uh, it isn't like something that is like a clear memory, or is it part of what would be a soul memory from a time that might have been millions of years ago, and that for some reason they're back around in this solar system, this time on Earth, and that by being here, the soul link to consciousness has this recording of what happened on Mars. It, it, these are all of the fascinating questions that keep coming up in the human abduction syndrome, where there are so many strange dreams, as if the people can st say that they had their first experience with a memory that was not on Earth, say, as a child, and then as a teenager, and then in their 20s, and then in their 30s. And again, the weaving of storylines and images, and yet they can't break through clearly about what planet, which ETs, what is the issue. And that may be because the ETs, if in some variations on the what are in these treaties, are supposed to erase the memories of the people they abduct. So it is so hard to know how many levels are on human consciousness that are being manipulated. And that's another part of getting the truth out, to stop all of the secret manipulation and come to terms with what the truth is on all of these levels and maybe some joyous day, having a communal celebration between a variety of extraterrestrials and humans, ironically on Earth, cheering each other after all of these millennia of lies and policies of denial. It's an incredible time. Well, Ian, uh, it's 8.30, and I would like to take time for one more question in this wonderful audience. Well, at the moment, I'm just going to share a few more comments. People okay. are saying that those James Webb pictures were from the time of the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, heady and mind-bending. And we're also getting a, a comment from Sarah Keller again. She says, honestly, I get a little freaked out and excited looking into the endless sky, which is what Moonbird's doing at the moment in Santa Clara. Yeah, and let me just add, the... A James Webb Space Telescope, its goal is to get all the way back to the very beginning of all. And that's 13.8 billion light years. Uh, they're working their way to get the telescope to 13.6 by sometime in the future. And the current photos, the, the one that has the beautiful galaxies in infrared, that goes back in time 4.6 billion. I wondered why they chose that and then it hit me. Our solar system, Earth, the sun, 4.6 billion light years. So the furthest that the James Webb telescope went in that incredible photo of all the galaxies and in infrared would be at the point in time that this solar system was born. Just think about that. And they're going to keep going and going, but they won't be to the beginning until the telescope reaches 13.8 billion. And what exactly prevents or slows it down or why it can't be done immediately, I don't fathom. But there's a lot, lot more to go with the James Webb 
So on that note, Ian, with all of the mysteries coming and all of these uh, incredible insights from this fantastic audience, I want to say one more time, agape love to everyone, everywhere. Ian, Thank last you. word, go ahead. Linda, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes. You are just breaking up there. Okay, we for dreams, Becky says, our souls are immortal and eternal and can never be destroyed. Well, that is my assumption as well. But that means that the souls sure have a hell of a lot to do in infinity. <laughs> well, whatever, let's keep trying for the truth the truth, sharing with each other, and that everything that we are trying to do is put into the embrace of an agape love for fellow beings, for fellow consciousnesses, that that's how we humans could help each other if we weren't looking through lenses of skin color, sex, and all of the other things, that we are conscious beings on this incredible planet in an amazing solar system in a fantastic universe and it's just thrilling to be alive to be able to learn that's i hope what will bring us together if we are told the truth about this incredible universe that is filled with consciousness on that note i'll see you next week i love you guys Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions have, will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>